Hello everyone, I hope everyone's well. I'm doing well, I've had a big bowl of noodles and I'm now keen to do some physics. Today, I'll be answering question 32 of the, me the medical physics section of the 2017 HSC physics paper. So, I've answered this this document in, a pre in another document, so I'll just go to that. So you don't have to watch me writing everything out. So, question 32 asks, or for part A, part I. In an endoscope, how do the arrangement of fibers in coherent and incoherent bundles differ? So an endoscope is just a bundle of optical fibers that are used to image um, inside, take images of things inside the body, basically. So here I've got, in an incoherent bundle, the optical fibers are not parallel to each other along the bundle and do not line up at the ends, so they produce distorted images. Coherent bundles are more expensive to produce and are designed so the optical fiber fibers bundled together remain parallel together and they line up at each end so a recognizable image can be transmitted. So that's a two mark question. I just need to talk about the fibers, how, or rather how the fibers are arranged in, an, in a coherent bundle and an incoherent bundle. Do you need to draw a picture for this one? No, you don't, but I did draw one just to enhance understanding for you guys. And that might be a good idea for your HSC exam too. You might prefer to convey more of your meaning via pictures than written word, maybe you're better at doing that. So it's a good idea, it can be a good idea to have a combination of these sort of approaches, but you don't need to do both. So an incoherent bundle is the one I've got on the left. And we can see that the incoherent bundle, that the black cylinder is kind of, is the bundle of fibers. And inside that, and each of the red lines is a fiber. So on the left, we can see that the red lines or the red fibers, the optical fibers sort of move around each other and they don't line up at each end. So they swap places at each end of the cylinder in the incoherent bundle. Whereas in the coherent bundle, all of the optical fibers, which are the red lines, just go straight from one end straight to the other and they maintain their position relative to each other. So if one, if one fiber starts on the left of the other fiber, it ends at the left on the left of the other fiber. And what this does, we'll actually we'll answer that in the next question. Okay. So, Part two asks, explain how light is used to create an endoscopic image. So that's a three mark question. The optical fibers utilize total internal reflection to trap light inside each fiber. That's pretty important there. Total internal reflection. Light is delivered inside the body using the cheaper incoherent bundles, which then reflects off the tissues in the body. The reflected light is then recaptured by the coherent bundles and is delivered to a camera or computer giving a view inside the body. So the incoherent bundles, so both the incoherent and coherent bundles are capable of transmitting light and they transmit it equally well. But the incoherent bundle does, cannot produce a, an undistorted image. All it's gonna, it's gonna mix up all the light that comes in one end and where it compares to where it come out, compared to where it comes out the other end. So incoherent bundles, which are, cheap to, are cheaper to produce, are great for transmitting light inside the body. So when you need to shine a torch up someone's anus, for instance, then that is a great way to do it because it can deliver that light really far into the body without any distortion, or with distortion, but that doesn't matter. Whereas for the coherent bundle, that light that is delivered by the incoherent bundle shines onto some tissues inside the body. It reflects off those tissues and the coherent bundle, the coherent bundle of optical fibers can then take in that light and deliver it to a camera or out of the computer where it can be recorded. So that's how, that's the difference there. So for that three, those three marks, I said optical fibers utilize total internal reflection. Light is delivered inside the body using the incoherent bundles. And we've got light is delivered. And the reflected light is then recaptured by the coherent bundles. And those three sentences or those three ideas give me my three marks there. Okay, part B, part I asks, describe how ultrasound can be used to measure one property of bone. So ultrasound is just very high frequency sound waves. They're much higher than humans can hear them and they're in the, they're in the megahertz range. Humans can typically only hear in the kilohertz range. So for this question, it's only two marks, it's pretty easy. Ultrasound can be used to describe to measure the density of bone by measuring the attenuation and reflection of sound waves. The higher the density of bone, the higher the attenuation. So 
This is a describe question. So it's a pretty simple sort of answer. Don't have to put in, don't have to put in too much detail. That, and the key word there is, in this one, answer, is attenuation. And if you're not sure what that means, attenuation is very similar to absorption. So sound waves penetrate the bone and they are absorbed by the bone. So, or well, some are absorbed by the bone and some get reflected. The higher the density of the bone, the less sound waves are absorbed or attenuated, if you want to think of it that way. And the lower the density of the bone, more, the more um, sound waves that are going to be reflected. Cool. So that's how ultrasound can be used to measure the property of the density of bones. Okay. Part 2 asks, B scans typically use ultrasound waves of frequency 20 MHz, whereas sector scans typically use ultrasound waves of frequency 3.5 MHz. Account for the use of different frequencies in terms of the purposes of these scans. So B scans and sector scans are both just different ways of using ultrasound, and they use and they use at different frequencies. The different frequencies used by ultrasound have different effects. If you use higher frequencies, they tend to reflect more easily. They don't penetrate as far into tissues or into the body, especially, and but they do also have higher resolution. So B scans, which are higher frequency are great for shallow, um, high resolution imaging. But sector scans, which are great, um, which are used in pregnancy ultrasounds, um, they're great for penetrating deeper into tissues, penetrating well below the skin, and seeing the outline of a fetus, especially a fetus or other organs, and just to see, see what's going on inside the body. As a result though, of that lower frequency, sector scans have less resolution than B scans typically do. So they do, so each one is optimal for a certain purpose. If you want to see what I wrote, I said, B scans are used for high resolution shallow imaging that only requires high frequencies around 20 megahertz. The higher frequency of this ultrasound scan reduces the penetration of sound waves into the deeper tissues. Sector scans are used for imaging deep tissues and utilize lower frequencies like three and a half megahertz. Okay, so that was part two. Part C asks, pardon me, explain how the application of a radio frequency wave changes the behavior of nuclei with net spin in a strong external magnetic field. So there's a lot to this question, it's four marks. It says explain, and we need to explain how the nuclei behave and what's happening there and the physics of it. So there's a fair bit to this question, a fair bit of understanding required. I will explain parts of it, but I wouldn't, I'm probably not gonna explain the full depth of all of this in this video. If you need a video on that, or if you do need to find that information somewhere, it is out there. But if you would like me to make a video on it, please let me know in the comment section. Okay. So, the nuclear, I'll start this by reading my answer and I'll explain what it means, what each part means, because it is pretty dense. The nuclei align with the magnetic field because they have their own magnetic spin that causes it to act as a tiny magnet. The nuclei also process at their own Lamour frequency, which is dependent on the nuclei and the magnetic field. The nuclei that have a parallel alignment with the magnetic field are at a slightly lower energy than those that are anti-parallel with the field. Since there are slightly more nuclei aligned with the field than against it, this results in a net magnetization with the field. When the nuclei absorb radio wave pulses, they flip to the opposite alignment. So those that start out parallel to the field flip to become anti-parallel to the field. When, radio wave, when the radio wave pulses are turned off, all the nuclei that absorbed a pulse and flipped will re-emit those radio waves and flip back to their original orientation. So. The key idea is here. So we have to explain exactly why the nuclei do what they're doing and how we use that. We don't have to explain how it's used. We just have to explain um, how it... So we don't have to explain how it can be used, but we just do want to explain um, how they work, basically. Now, the first key idea. The nuclei align with the magnetic field because they have their own magnetic spin that causes it to act as a tiny magnet. So... This is a quantum mechanics sort of effect. We didn't realize this for a very long time. That every, well, most particles, I should say, with non-zero net spin are able to act. Also, they spin on their own axis. 
and they create their own tiny magnetic field. So we can kind of picture every particle, or most particles, act as their own tiny little bar magnet. And the same way um, iron filings will align with a bar magnet that's placed under a piece of paper, um, the particles, or these tiny magnets, will align with a very strong external magnetic field. Now, because they are spinning, or we, we don't say that they're spinning, but they have their own property of spin. And we say, because they're spinning, and they also align with an external magnetic field, they actually, they don't align perfectly with that magnetic field, but they do sort of orbit, they don't orbit, they rotate around it. They rotate around that external magnetic field. And that's rotating on its own axis. That's what, and that's what precession is. That's what we're talking about when we say precess. So these nuclei precess at their own Lamour frequency. And that Lamour frequency is dependent on the nuclei. So it's usually hydrogen atoms. Because yeah. this is usually for MRI machines, this, this effect that we're talking about. And we're effectively just talking about hydrogen atoms. Um, so the nuclei is just a proton. And we talk about, so it's dependent on the, the proton in this case, the properties of the proton, and it's talk, talking about the magnetic field. Okay, so the strength, the higher the field, the higher the Lamour frequency. Now, we've already said that these tiny magnets will align with that external magnetic field. Now, they can actually align to be parallel to that field, or they can align to be anti parallel to the field. So they can be point, so if they're anti parallel, that means they're pointing in the opposite direction. Now, because of gypsy magic physics reasons, we say that those that have a parallel alignment are at a slightly lower energy than those that are anti-parallel with the field. So uh, because of that, overall, there are more, slightly more nuclei absorbed, like aligned with the field than against it. And an example might be that we have three nuclei aligned with the field and then maybe two against it. And if that were the case, well, the net magnetization would actually be with the field or in the direction of the field. Now, it's much more, um, sorry, I should say it's much closer than just a three to two ratio of nuclei that are with the field rather than against it. But it doesn't really matter. It, is, it shows the point that most nuclei are with the field. And it means there's a net magnetization in the direction of the external field. Now we come to the really interesting effect is that once this magnetic field has been applied, these hydrogen atoms are able to absorb um, the energy from radio waves, and they have an interesting effect. So when they absorb the energy from those radio wave pulses, which are tuned to the Lamour frequency of each of those atoms, or each of those um, protons, I should say, if they start out parallel to the field, they then they absorb those radio waves and they flip to become anti-parallel to the field and they remain anti-parallel to the field when those radio wave pulses are then turned off they they flip back they release their own radio wave pulse and they flip back to their original orientation so in this diagram that i've drawn here we see two protons with a with their own magnetic field um, that's drawn in black and it's aligned with the external magnetic field that's drawn in blue they absorb energy as we go to the right, and we see that the protons now have now flipped and they're upside down, and they're in fact spinning in the opposite direction relative, oh, don't know what that was, to the external magnetic field. When those pulses are turned off, they then release energy, and they release energy by emitting their own radio waves. When they do that, they flip back to their original orientation. Now, so that was a four mark question. I think my explanation is pretty good, and I think you'd get the full marks just for that explanation. But what would probably help, if you weren't too sure of your explanation, it might really help to draw a picture, because that sort of picture can really um, fill in any gaps that you might have missed with your, with your explanation. So that was a four mark question. Guys, I might cut the video there, and I'll make a new video for the rest of question 32. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a thumbs up. If you dislike, it, leave a thumbs down. And if there's anything more you'd like to see, please leave a comment in the comment section below. Okay, guys, I hope you have a good afternoon.